Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas is proud to partner with the Texas Tribune to provide free public events like the one you're about to see. These candid conversations are designed to promote public dialogue and civic engagement throughout the state. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Myra Crownover, Tan Parker, and Ron Simmons. <laughs> Appreciate you all being here. We're going to spend our time today looking ahead to the 2015 session, but I thought we might actually first look back to the 2014 elections, which are less than a month ago, but still feel very fresh, at least in my mind. And you cannot talk about the 2014 elections in Denton without talking about the fracking ban which was approved and will go into effect tomorrow. It was approved with almost 59% of the vote in Denton. Now, you three good Republicans talk all the time about local control. So I know that since the voters of Denton supported the fracking ban, <laughs> this is going to be a long hour if you don't let me ask these questions. Since I know that uh, you all support local control and the voters of Denton voted for a fracking ban overwhelmingly, surely you support the will of the voters and will support the fracking ban, Representative Crownover. Yes, um, Denton is in my district. Yes. And um, while I didn't think that was the right solution, there are problems that we needed to address. And while that wasn't the right solution, I have, I have worked very... Let's be sure the microphone is turned on. Hello. Please. How about that? Better? Okay. Okay. Keeps you were saying, clear. because this is your district. My district, and I have worked very hard to represent my community, and yes. so uh, I will not be working on anything in the legislature that would interfere with the fracking ban. I think it's time, since it is in the courts, I think right. it's time to see how that works out in the court system. So, so Chairman Christy Craddock of the Texas Railroad Commission, who told me two days after the election that she believed there might well be some legislative action, if not action, at the Railroad Commission to thwart the will of the voters of Denton who supported this ban. You do not support any efforts in Austin to overturn the will of the voters? No. Uh, Chairman Parker, what do you say about this? Uh, a lot, lot of complaints about who might have affected the outcome of this vote. I've heard it was some dirty hippies who came in from out of town. <laughs> There's even what I would describe as the Scooby-Doo argument, all these college kids. If not for these meddling kids, this ban wouldn't have passed. Well, what do you think about that? Look, the, the reality is I think most people know in this room where I am. I, I was disappointed, obviously, that the ban passed. I think it is uh, economically detrimental to Texas and to the country, yeah. uh, and to Denton in particular. And I think the economic data shows that. If you look at the Ray Perryman study and so forth, you clearly see that uh, you know, significant economic harm, I think, will be caused to the region. With that being said, obviously we respect the, the will of the folks here in Denton, and I think as uh, Representative Crownover said a moment ago, we'll leave it for the courts to, to figure out uh, where we go from here. So you too will not be involved in any legislative efforts to overturn the ban? I, I think it's important that we respect the, the voters here, but I, again, my belief is, is that it's a shame that what has occurred, we need to find ways to address the issues, uh, right. I think on a, on a better way, a better fat, a better, I would say, coexistence going forward, because I think it's so important economically for Texas. Representative, you agree with your colleagues here? Yeah. You do? From an economic development standpoint, are you concerned that the ban will have a detrimental effect on, De on Denton County? I think any time that you, you enter a, a situation like this where the emotions run high and people are very interested in it, that we... Microphone? We, can, let me ask the... Can you can, hear me? That may be good for y'all. <laughs> um, anytime emotions run high on an issue, what generally happens is that you have the tendency to, for the pendulum to swing too far. Right. So we have to evaluate that. You know, unlike, unlike uh, the United States, which is made up as, as a group of states that authorize the federal government, Texas doesn't work that way. Cities are political subdivisions of the state. Right. So as legislators, we have to make sure that the, that the, the rules and regulations inside political subdivisions are appropriate. Right. And I think we just have to evaluate that. The people of Denton have clearly spoken. Right. So we have to err on that side of the equation, but we do have to evaluate it. Right. That's one of our roles. So as a general principle representative, if the city, uh, uh, voters in the city of Denton want to approve a fracking ban or the voters of the city of San Antonio want to approve, as they did year before last, an increase in the sales tax to fund pre-K, or the voters of Travis County want to increase their property taxes to pay for a medical school, communities can vote to do what they see fit to do. Well, I think, I think we have to pay very close attention to that, but we yeah. also have to understand how our Constitution works. And again, 
uh, the cities are political subdivisions of the state. Yeah. So we have to make sure that those don't have any negative impacts on the remainder of the state as right. well. Representative Parker, the, the byproduct of, of, of the 2014 elections, notwithstanding the Denton fracking ban, was essentially more of the same. The Republican House got a little bit more Republican, not materially more, a couple more seats. On the Senate side, materially not much different, one more Republican senator. And statewide elected officials ran the table on the Republican end. Are we looking at 2015 being not entirely different as a result than the 2013 session? Well, I think we'll have a very, very exceptionally successful session here when we uh, start the new session January 13th. I think right. we'll accomplish a number of, of great conservative measures as we have in, in recent years. And I think with obviously the leadership of General Abbott now becoming governor and uh, obviously Dan Patrick, uh, his leadership as lieutenant governor, along with what we'll do in the House, uh, I think it'll be a great, a great thing for Texas. But so. do you think it'll be very different? Because again, you're going to have a little bit under a supermajority in both houses for the Republicans or Republican statewides. Theoretically, we're not going to see massive differences in the way state government is, is executed or prosecuted. I, I think you'll see very much the same what we've seen in recent years. And I, and I right. think that you know, we'll work very closely, obviously, with, with uh, Governor Abbott and right. obviously Lieutenant Governor Patrick. And I think we'll have, like I said, a very successful session. And I think it'll be right. largely the same. I think you'll see the chambers work together very, very well. Right. And I, I think at the end of the day, the people of Texas will be pleased with the conservative agenda that we passed. Vice Chairman Crownover, the fact is uh, the, the legislature uh, institutionally, it's not going to be any different. You're still going to have to pass uh, bills. You're going to have to work, as, as Chairman Parker says. House and Senate are going to have to work together. You're going to have to coordinate with statewide elected officials. But at the end of the day, there are some people who don't believe that the last legislative session was conservative enough and are looking to this session to produce more conservative results. What comfort can you give those people that you will see a more conservative legislature, or is it going to be pretty much status quo from last time? Set for me. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think what's different about this time is um, you have to look back, and I guess that's one of the advantages of having someone that served a longer time. Uh, in the last 10 years or 12 years, uh, you look at, and, and a lot of these people forget what we have been through from whence we come. So we had 9 11, then we had Katrina, Rita, Gustav, Ike. We had the wildfires up in the Panhandle. We've had the uh, Bastrop tragedies with the wildfires there. And then, after all of that, we top it off with an unprecedented recession of 08. So when I talk about it, I say that we have really been playing hurt all these years, right. uh, making do with less. And I think Texas has done a very good job. Other states. Uh, when I visit with people from other states, other legislators, they, they say, I wish we could have done what you did. And I think the turning point was in 03, when we had the recession and we had the $10 billion shortage, and we did not raise taxes. Right. And uh, other states did, and we came out of the recession sooner. And so I think uh, other states look to us for leadership, and I think our federal government could stand looking to us from leadership. Yep. But now we're in a different time because of oil and gas, and this may be temporary, because if you've checked oil and gas prices today. Started to go down. Right. right. So this may be a one-time opportunity for us to not play hurt. Now, I don't, people talk about a surplus. I don't think if you look at our needs, and the things we have not done, we don't really have a surplus. But this is a one-time opportunity for right. us to deal with infrastructure, for us to deal with education in a smart, measured, logical way that is respectful to the Texas taxpayers and respectful to the next generations of Texas. So you think there's a way, Vice Chairman, to spend money on many of these priorities you named and others, but still at the end of the day, give the people of Texas a conservative government? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I use the story of a, a man in West Texas that lived so frugally. His daughters had, had no advantages. Um, they lived in a shack, and his girls couldn't go to college. And when he died, he died with several million dollars in the bank. That's not conservative. Uh, conservatives take care of their infrastructure. If we do not do that, yep. 
and we hand our children and grandchildren a state where people are undereducated, where our infrastructure is crumbling, old, and out of date, I don't think we can beat ourselves on the chest and say, weren't we conservative? Representative Simmons, do you think that the legislature, and oh, let me ask you specifically about the House last time, was sufficiently conservative in the way it passed legislation? Well, I, I think that we did some good things. Uh, did everything that I want to get done, get done? No. Uh, I mean, I, again, I am a proponent of some form of zero-based budgeting. I've come yep. from a financial background. I would have liked to have seen that get done. I would like to have seen that. here. Microphone. You can't hear? Okay. Well, I just announced for president, so I'm sorry you missed it. Yeah. Uh, but no. Uh, it's a shame I, you didn't hear the news yeah. being made, actually, yeah. up here. Uh, right. I think we didn't get as much done as I would have liked to have done, although I do think we had a great session. We had a transformational water bill. Uh, I would have liked to have seen for us, instead of having to fund that out of the rainy day fund, to fund that through a small cut. Uh, across the board, to, I, I passed her. I did a deal where I, I got my business card out and I, I glued two pennies to it and I stuck it on every member's desk and I said, would you give two cents for the future of Texas? Now, some of them sent it back to me and said, I can't accept co campaign contributions during session, <laughs> right. things like that. But I, I actually think, you know, I was um, I'm always pleased when we come out of things like what we did on HB2, yep. what we did on uh, HB4 and those types of things we could always do a little more and a little bit better, and I think we will this time. Right, absolutely. Uh, Re Representative Parker, you and uh, your colleagues up here on stage all uh, uh, stepped out and, and supported Speaker Strauss for re-election in the 2015 session as the leader of the Texas House. Uh, that to me reads as if you support his leadership of a conservative house and believe that his leadership in 2015 would likewise result in a conservative house. Is that true? Evan, that's my belief. I mean, I think the speaker has proven himself the last several sessions. We've had a number of very good conservative successes, as Ron just mentioned a moment ago. Right. Uh, obviously, there's always room for improvement. We can always uh, be more conservative, in my opinion, and pass other legislation. Ron mentioned some good things. And I feel confident uh, that the speaker will enable us uh, as members to achieve a very conservative agenda in this next session. So, uh, absolutely. So, you understand, Representative Chairman, this is a controversial issue in parts of the state, in this part of the state, possibly in this very room. The re-election of Speaker Strauss is something that divides the Republican Party in some quarters. You are willing to brook any disagreements that you may have with some of your constituents and some people up here in, in voting to re-elect the speaker? I, I am, I, I'm, you know, I think it's the right decision for Texas. It's time for us to focus on policy and not politics at this point. And I, I believe that uh, we're ready to do that and we'll have a great session. I think the people of Texas, the members, if you will, have already spoken right. broadly on this issue, uh, as we did obviously on this stage. And I think, you know, going forward, we'll have, a, a, again, a very successful conservative session and people here in the room what I encourage everybody to do is to judge us by our results in May, and I think we'll have a, a good session. Right. Vice Chairman Crownover, the people who oppose Speaker Strauss's re-election as Speaker would say, we are judging you by your results. We think that the House should have been more conservative last time, think it should, have been more, should be more conservative next time, and in Scott Turner, State Representative from Frisco, you have a more conservative alternative who might be able to do some things and accomplish some things that Speaker Strauss was not able to accomplish. What do you say to that? Well, uh, that is their right, just like I could run for speaker right now if I wanted to. So, and that, that's the way the process works. Right. But the way the process works also is you have to know how to count. And it's a, uh, at the end of the day, the speaker's race is a math problem, isn't it? Yeah, it, it yeah. is a math problem. And it's kind of unique in that it's not really a statewide election. It is an election of people that have worked hours and hours and hours in committee hearings and on the floor. Uh, during the pro-life uh, situation, we were on the floor till four in the morning. Went back in, took a nap, and came back at six. Right. So we have been working shoulder to shoulder with these people for uh, an unbelievable amount of time. During good times, during hard times, we have worked together, thought together, laughed together. And so it is um, a situation where a each member uh, would vote who they would like to be their leader. Right. Uh, it's just like I heard on uh, football, they said um, one of the coaches was saying that really the players choose their quarterback. Who do they follow? 
who has exhibited the leadership that they want to follow. And I kind of thought that was the same situation. So, so in your mind, Joe Strauss is your quarterback, and you've got no hesitation about that. Right. Representative, it is a math problem, but the fact that the math looks to be good for Speaker Strauss has led some people to say that members, not suggesting you, but some members may be siding with Speaker Strauss because they realize that if they cast the vote they'd like to cast, they'll be banished. They'll be put on a committee that meets in Juneau, Alaska, twice for the session. <laughs> Um, do you think that people are making a practical calculation but not necessarily adhering to their own conservative beliefs? Yeah, well, I can't speak for anybody else, uh, but I can speak for myself in that, you know, I didn't get into this business when I was 30 years old trying to make a career out of it. Right. I entered this business after already being where all of you are, working on a business, working, right. raising, uh, raising a family and whatever, and I don't have any agenda other than what is best for Texas. And so right. what I did when I went down there last year, Evan, oh, did I get on the committees I wanted? I didn't even know what all the committees were, honestly. I'm, I'll <laughs> right. admit that today, right? I, I had a hard time finding my office for a while. Uh, it is 667 steps from my office to my desk on the House floor. I know that for yes, a fact. I do now. know that. Exactly. Uh, but what I did is I said, you know what? And I met with the Speaker Strauss at that time, and we didn't know each other. I said, Speaker Strauss, you don't know me. I don't know you. I said, but here's what I will do. I will work. I will come down here and do the yeah. work. I went in and I sat in on every appropriations committee hearing, even though I wasn't on the committee. I've That's been right. sitting in on all the sunset committee hearings this session, even though I'm not on it. I want to do the work, okay? Right. So I think all of the stuff about committees and all this is way overblown. If a member wants to go do the work and give back to Texas, they can do that. Right. And so I believe that's what we need to be focusing on. At the end of the day, the issues really are what matter. Mm -hmm. So, right. so let, and I think even the people who support Representative Turner and his bid to be speaker would say it's not about the speaker's vote, it's about the agenda. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the issues that you all are going are to deal with in the session, beginning with public education, which is always the issue that people want to talk about as we travel the state. There were the uh, famous and historic cuts of the 2011 session to public education. Much of that cut was bought back in the last session, not all of it, but a bunch of that money that was cut in 2011 was reinstated in 2013 population of the state continues to grow, and relative to other states, Texas is somewhere between $2,000 and $3,000 per enrolled student below the average spent. So other states are spending more per student on public ed than Texas is. Representative Parker, Chairman, should we be putting more money into public ed to try to get us up closer to what other states are spending in this session? Look, let me go back for a minute and talk about 2011. So when we had to make those cuts, we had to cut over $5 billion. Right. That's very difficult. We, of course, were facing a $12 billion budget shortfall. So I want everybody to recognize that was the reality that we were facing at the time. And so every agency of government was affected. And so, you know, without question, it's a very difficult process to take money from great causes like public education. I'm one that doesn't believe that more money necessarily equates to better performance in the schools. I believe in accountability. I believe in making certain that we have transparency in the process. I believe in creating, if you will, mechanisms that enable great teachers to teach in a classroom. That's yep. how ultimately we can be successful. So I don't necessarily subscribe to the fact that more money equates to better education. Now, if we have the ability to intelligently put more money in to restore the cuts that have made in the past, and we have the ability to do that, then, then yes, I'm open to doing that, Evan. But to throw more money blindly without looking at how it's done, in my opinion, uh, is a mistake. So that's not your first priority. If there is, as, as Vice Chairman Crownover says, perhaps more money available this time because of good economic times, public ed would not be your first priority. Well, I think, let me say this, I think education broadly is our highest priority always. Right. And so I'm just simply saying that if we have the money, then yes, we will definitely look at putting it into public education without any question. But the, at the same time, we need to recognize that yeah. there's not always a one-to-one -one correlation. I put more money in right. that's going to create a, or yield a better result. Right. And, and that's my belief. V Vice Chairman, I hear what Representative Parker, Chairman, says, and I've heard this repeatedly from people. It's not only about the money, but if you look at the TEA's rankings of schools, it is an undeniable fact that the schools that are rated exemplary spend on average $1,000 more per student than the schools at the bottom. That, to me, sounds like a correlation between spending and performance. So would you, would you look at putting money into public education funding in well, the next session? Well, we know um, that Texas cannot be a first-rate state without a first-rate education system. Do we have one now? Uh, no, but we are moving in that direction. And I think, you know, when I came into the legislature, there, uh, and I was a teacher, I taught school, so there were kind of two groups. One group said, 
oh, you can never spend enough money on education. You know, a child is so precious. Right. The other group said, oh, we're spending too much money on this. And I didn't feel comfortable with either group. Um, I think we're, we're moving where we have the metrics. We can understand where costs are going. We can understand where you get value, where you get a bump. I, I'm really excited that this is becoming a more intelligent way that we look at what is the yeah. right amount to spend. I mean, you have to, if you're a company, how much does it cost to produce a first way rate product? Yeah. And I think we're in a more, that more intelligent, more creative, um, uh, kind of a multitask approach <clears throat> where we say, what, what is the right amount? And there's data and there's research that perhaps guides that decision. Right. Representative Simmons, you would agree. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I, you know, I come from a family of teachers. In fact, my dad is still a high school band director at age 78 back wow. in Arkansas. Yeah. My mom's a retired teacher. My wife taught. My daughter-in-law is a teacher. My niece. So I, I grew up in public education. And what I've found, Evan, is that what we try to do is we try to do the very best we can to overcome a problem that is more of a societal problem than it is an education problem. Our education challenges, if you look at those schools that are underperforming, and maybe the underfunding is part of the equation, but part of the equation is if you don't have at least one parent involved in a child's education, I'm sorry, but yep. it is a losing scenario. And no amount of spending nothing. on public ed There's is going to resolve we just, that. We just can't do it. I wish we could. Yeah. I would give my own personal money to right. do that, but it will not happen. And so what we have to do is also focus on what type of incentives can we provide to help heal the family right. and help heal. So what, what, what I'm hearing from the group is open to the idea of putting money into public ed, but not necessarily. So we're on a college campus and we have elected or officials of another public university system uh, here, here with us. Uh, let me then ask about higher ed. The state's contribution to higher ed funding has been in a precipitous decline for the last 25 years. Tuition's been deregulated. The cost of a Texas public, at least a public university education, is a bargain in the eyes of some people, but nonetheless, families are having to bear a larger share of the higher ed costs than they used to, say, a, a generation ago. Are you all willing to commit to putting more money into higher ed this time, perhaps reversing, Chairman Parker, what has been of, of late a decline in the state's contribution? Evan, I, again, I, I'm certainly very open to that. Let me just make a comment on the earlier question first, and that is my children, of course, are in the public school system. And so uh, I believe passionately in our public school system and the importance of them being successful. And so, you know, again, I just, my fundamental belief is that yeah. more money doesn't always equate to better results. We obviously have to be very prudent this session to make certain from a budgeting perspective that we are ready, ready to address whatever comes from the courts, right? We obviously right, we have a school finance lawsuit are. that is working its way through the appellate process. A now. Absolutely, so to see what ultimately <clears> takes <throat> place will obviously determine what kind of action we need to take financially as well, and so we'll be watching that very closely. Right. Uh, but with regard to higher ed, obviously, you know, Myra commented a moment ago, we're very blessed to have such wonderful institutions right here in Denton County with TWU and this wonderful campus, and uh, UNT obviously just around the corner. And, and the reality is, is that yes, I need to continue to, I believe, aggressively uh, support, if you will, our institutions of higher learning. I think additional money uh, potentially is possible and, and should be a priority. The question really in my mind is how do we control the cost right now of tuition for students? I'm very concerned about as many Texans as possible having access to the American dream, the Texas, ex the Texas dream, if you will, of higher education. Yeah. And having the opportunity to go to one of our oh, fine universities. Would you so consider? Re would expensive. you consider, as some of your colleagues in the legislature, not just Democrats but also Republicans, have re-regulating tuition to get a handle on that question of the cost going up and up? I, I think that's a very fair debate to have that discussion to talk about, you know, how expensive obviously tuition can be. I think there's an initiative, as you all remember, a couple of years ago that uh, Governor Perry tried to control or put some containment, if you will, on the cost by coming up with less expensive degrees and yep. so on and so forth. I think that's a very healthy discussion for the people of Texas and to work in concert with all of our universities and so forth, but at the same time to give them the resources they need to be world class. Uh, because yeah. we certainly recognize that there's a direct correlation between a workforce that's prepared right. for a 21st century global economy right. and one that's not. And we want to continue to be on the side of history that we're well prepared for the future. Vice Chairman, the fact is there's an economic development component to the higher ed question. No right? Tremendous, right. tremendous. So would you consider re-regulating tuition to get a handle on, uh, on the cost of, of, of getting a degree? 
Well, part of it you have to think about, you know, when, when John Conley, he put our higher education system on the map for the United States. That was his moonshot, wasn't it? Yes, that yeah. was his moonshot. Right. And my family have been beneficiaries of that. Right. All four of my sons have gone to state-supported uh, universities. Right. And that has been a blessing for us. And back when I wrote my first tuition check, it was for $630. I don't want to scare you, but it costs more now. And if, uh, <laughs> and if, and if your kids were going to send their kids to a Texas public university today, the, the fact is it would cost quite a bit more and the state would be paying quite a bit less than it did back then. So what do you do about that? Well, also, though, I was thinking uh, if we're, so right now, I think the University of North Texas, the state supports them at a level of 20%. So it's kind of hard. It's almost like the federal government telling the states what to do when the states need to be independent. They need to be free to get it wrong or get it right. Um, I don't, with, if we're supporting the universities at 50%, then I think we should weigh in on tuition, but we are not. We have backed away from our support of our universities. Uh, last session, something I worked on day in and day out was the TRBs. This is tuition, revenue, bonds, the opportunity to build new buildings and to expand facilities. A UNT has not had, or we have not done a tuition revenue bond. That's how you build buildings. Now, I mean, we don't want just bricks and mortar for the sake of bricks and mortar, but it was 05 since we had our last TRBs. Right. The University of North Texas has grown by over 20% since right. then. I was with uh, Dr. Daniel at uh, UTD, yeah, that's right. and they, he was driving me around campus and said, he showed me this big, beautiful engineering building. He said, we need two more of those, and we need them tomorrow. Right. So uh, we're, um, we have wonderful successes to be proud of and grateful for. But, you know, with growth comes the we have, opportunity. We have needs. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that actually is a good point, you know, Representative Simmons. We brag about 1,000 people coming to Texas a day, but they're not bringing public university buildings with them. They're not bringing water with them. They're not bringing health care with them. Roads. They're not bringing asphalt with them. The fact is we are at risk, and higher ed is a great example of becoming victims of our own success in this state where... The growth of our population is straining the resources we have. So are we at a point on higher ed where we think we need to put more money back in to accommodate this growth that we're so proud of? Well, I'm a good person to ask because I actually use the college buildings more than most. I squeeze uh, four years of college into 10, so I, I was there for, for a while. Well, you just liked it a lot. That's yeah. what it was, yeah. Actually, I, I think we need to readdress the whole issue of tuition deregulation. I wasn't here when that was discussed, so I'd like to see that because our current pattern is not sustainable, <coughs> and we have to decide. Like, I don't like the idea. In fact, I just passed a bill because I, I some people asked me, I mean, filed a bill. Uh, people asked me to file it, and I think it's right, on tuition set-asides, where a portion of hardworking middle-class people's part of their child's tuition goes to be set aside for people that uh, you know need some help on that and I'm not so sure that that we ought to ask middle class taxpayers to do that I don't have the answer to the formula so I hate to even complain without having right. the answer but I do think that we need to to reassess and I think we have to bring industry and business in if they want us to have a workforce right they need to hire right. then then they also need to bring more to the they table sure have a stake in it let me just ask as a show of hands one of you representative crownover was in the legislature when in-state tuition rates were, uh, were were passed as law for the children of undocumented uh, persons did you support that bill back then well actually that was a bill that put uh, constraints at the time that we voted on that yeah. um, every you could move from Mexico Right. This week, but, and you got, and so this was put a constraint that you had to have been here for three years. Well, there were conditions, of course. Right, I and that you had to be moving. But toward. you supported the law that has now that has been for ten or more years. The law of the state. Everyone of did. Right. Yes. Everyone. Did. Uh, I think there were three votes against. You it. know that there is now a move afoot to overturn in-state tuition rates for the children of undocumented persons, and in fact, the momentum going into this session has many of us outside the Capitol assuming that it's going to happen. Show of hands, which of you would vote to overturn the current in-state tuition law if it comes up in the next session? So we have unanimity on this. 
Representative Crownover, what changed? Uh, what changed is I'm on the Border Securities Committee with Dennis Bonham, and I have heard all the stories, and, and I think for every, for every story, and there are wonderful stories, of somebody coming from Mexico and getting an education, and, uh, and they are just so uplifting. But there are also the stories that I have been exposed to of somebody leaving Nicaragua. And what's the difference in being in a gang in Nicaragua and a gang in Houston, Texas? Except that when that young person is a gang in Houston, Texas, he's not even a citizen. So I have just decided, and I have, I have chewed on it and chewed on it, and I, I just think that any, because our, so we're trying to close the borders. That's a wonderful thing to do. I've been down to the border. I see how hard it is. I've seen the houses that are right up the, the block where people wade across the river, walk into a safe house, take a yeah. shower, walk out on the street. They're in the United States. Um, I think we have to get rid of every incentive. You think it's an incentive for because, people to be here illegal? Because right. it's not all a wonderful, glorious story of people living better lives. It is stories of women that are here yep. that are not citizens that are um, prey to any person that comes along and that wants to out them. So there, there is a lot of tragedy, right. and I, I believe in the rule of law. And if we forget the rule of law, and we just say, well, we can't do anything about it. Right. And I know the blame is that our, I, I listened to an all day hearing, and I came out with just felt like my hair was on fire. I thought if the federal, if I was wanting to design an immigration program that was guaranteed not to work, I be. would do exactly <laughs> what the federal what government, the federal is, government is doing has now. done. Now, Representative Simmons, you know that Governor Perry, if he were here with us today, based on what he said in 2012 during the presidential campaign and what he reiterated to me a few weeks back at the Texas Tribune Festival, he would say that the three of you are heartless for not supporting the opportunity for these kids who were not brought here because they came here. They were brought here not of their own volition. They've done whatever steps are necessary in advance of getting access to those in-state He would say you're heartless for not wanting those kids to have access to that right. What would you say back to him? One of the great things about the Republican Party is that we can disagree on policy issues. Well, people and sure disagreed with him, if I remember correctly, in 2012. The, I, would say, I would say that Governor yeah. Perry is wrong on that issue. While, I, while if I personally wanted to help pay for somebody's tuition, then that's my choice. I don't think it's my obligation to put that burden on all of the uh, taxpayer citizens of Texas. I just, right. I just do uh, not believe that's correct. Quickly, and then we'll go on. But back, to the, back to the yeah. fact that we're only paying 20%, maybe the university should be able to, if we're only paying 20% and they're coming up with the 80%, I think the university should own this situation and be free to make their own decision. And so the state should maybe get out of it. Right. Uh, you, you know this is part, Chairman, of a, a larger conversation about immigration. It is the thing that has come up as the first flashpoint. But the fact is the governor-elect and many of the new state officials, as well as many of the members of the legislature, think that immigration, maybe even more than public ed, and issues related to immigration, of which this is one, should be your first priority in the next session. you agree with that? Well, I, I mean, certainly a top priority. I mean, yeah. obviously, uh, education, obviously, in order to have a healthy economy and to be able to keep Texas at this kind of incredible growth of economic achievement, we've got to address education. But certainly it's at the top of the list of things for us to, to cover. Yeah. And, and I think, just as my colleagues have said, the, the world in my mind has really changed. I mean, you look at the policies right now of Washington, what this president is doing, and specifically, this is nothing more than an incentive, if you will, to bring folks more illegally here into the country. Yeah. And so we have to stop it, just like we're taking aggressive action on the border. We've tripled border security funding here in the last couple of sessions. Uh, apprehensions uh, have gone way down. Uh, so we're being very effective in what we're doing. And so uh, these are the issues where we can have a real difference, make a real difference. In my opinion, yeah. my colleagues think will agree with me, Washington has really forgotten its responsibility to Texas in the first place. Every dollar that we spend appropriating money for border security should be reimbursed by Washington, the people of Texas. But at the end of the day, what we are as lawmakers are tasked to deal with, it's our highest priority is the safety and security of all 27 million Texans. And as the corrections chairman, I see that firsthand. And so that's why I'm passionate that we've got to stop the incentive and why we've got to aggressively focus on securing the border as our first step in a meaningful way 
uh, to put something in place sustainably over long periods of time, we can address it. Because I think we're in a period in our history as a nation where we basically can forget about Washington and their assistance they're going to provide to Texas. Right. Let me let Representative Simmons in quick, then we're going to move on to Real two quick. other quick things. Uh, yeah. I said on the Homeland Security Committee yes, last sir. session, the very first question that I asked Commander McCraw, who's head of our uh, Department of Public Safety, I said, Commander McCraw, what's the number one risk to the, to the people that live in this state? Without hesitation, he said it's the Mexican drug cartels. Right. All over the state, that's where our greatest risk is. And that's what mainly we're trying to do at the border is to make sure that we curtail, reduce, eliminate the illegal activity, other than just crossing the border, but the illegal right. activity that comes with human smuggling, drug smuggling, and all of that. And, and so, so you, you share Chairman Parker's belief that that should be a priority from when, a funding I, standpoint. When I, yes, I do. When yeah. I polled my district, and I'm talking voters, not right. just Republican, but Republican and Democrat, Both. by far, two to one margin, border security was the number one number, number one. Number I mean, one. it wasn't even close. I was yeah. actually shocked yeah. that it was that much. But yeah. uh, I, I might just add real quick, and if you don't mind. Yeah. So I spent five out of six weeks this uh, summer down on the border in some various fashions, be it in hearings or touring. In fact, Representative Simmons and I took a trip uh, down there in the summer and saw firsthand what's taking place. But, you know, this is a critical, critical issue, and we've got to get on top of it. And as the corrections chairman, what I'll tell you is what concerns me is the correlation between crime that's happening here in Denton County and in Dallas, Fort Worth, and all across Texas. Over 600,000 crimes were committed by illegals between 2008 and the present. And that's a serious issue. So what do you do? I saw a poll today. The Quinnipiac organization did a poll of Republicans in the country. And in the last two years, Republicans used to favor in 2012 citizenship or a path to citizenship over deportation. Now a majority of Republicans support deportation as the principal means of dealing with the problem of undocumented persons in this country. Is the answer that we move to a much harder line stance and deport people who are here? Without look, papers? Look, my, my, my perspective is we obviously have a unique situation being a border state, obviously with Mexico. We're, we're very unique, unlike really any other state in the country. So I, I think if we secure the border, if we do it in an aggressive fashion, we'll allow Washington to figure out obviously what uh, our policy should be with regard to, to people who are already deportation here. and yeah. so on and so forth. I think those really are things that we overstep our jurisdiction if we get into those things as a state. Right. I think that's really the federal government, what it will do. But we certainly can absolutely make it very clear to the people of Texas and the country that we take security as a highest priority for us as, as the people of Texas. And we will, we will obviously have the opportunity to turn those folks over to the feds, and we hope the feds will take action. Uh, Vice Chairman, let me ask you about another issue quickly. We'll do two quick issues before we open it up to the audience. You mentioned infrastructure issues, water and transportation as things that were on your mind. And obviously, we've had two ballot uh, initiatives in 2013, 2014, water and transportation respectively, overwhelmingly passed. The fact is that the money appropriated in those two ballot initiatives for water and for transportation are not even remotely adequate to the challenges that we face as a state, in part because of the great population growth of the states training those resources. Are we going to have to go back to the well and put more money in for water and transportation in this session? Yes. We are? Yes. At a general um, revenue, or are you going to try to take money out of the rainy day fund again? Well, and I hope that legislators, uh, nobody wants to, uh, you know, spend Texas taxpayers' money unnecessarily. But I hope those two elections will send a message to us that, yes, Texas doesn't want to be a broken down state. We absolutely have to have enough water to keep our businesses here, to keep our families here. Right. We absolutely have to have transportation so that you spend your time getting where you need to be instead of stuck in traffic. But again, at, and funded out of general revenue, not out of some right. kind we, of special... We, we need, right. yes, we need to step up, act like adults, be the adults at the table, and say, you know, our transportation funding is not going to go away, and that one shot that we took does not get us where we need to be. In fact, it doesn't even annually get you to basically back to even. No. Right. Chairman, you're prepared to be an adult? Uh, <laughs> I, I am, Evan, yes, but, uh, you know, the, re the, re <laughs> the, the reality is, in my opinion, that, yes, we have to absolutely fund additional uh, infrastructure investments in water and roads, but I want to see it done out of general revenue. Ron commented about the way that, that he would like to see it be done. I think we're all in agreement on that going forward. And, and my view is that, you know, what we can do, just so people understand, one of the things that we're committed to doing this next session is to take today all the great work that's done by DPS, okay? 
All of those dollars, about $1.3 billion we would estimate over the biennium, we can take those dollars that are today coming out, if you will, of Fund 6, and we can address it in a meaningful way and end that diversion. So that will give us another $1.3 billion to put into transportation. But of course, you're going to have to replace those dollars now dedicated to DPS because sure. you're not going to defund public safety. Sure, of course not. So Absolutely. you're going to have to find that money somewhere else in the Absolutely. budget. Where are you to, going to find it? Well, we have to make tough decisions, and that, that's where we have to really... Do you have any tough decisions you want to mention to us today? <laughs> give us a, I, I, a preview I, of your thinking? I, I think we'll be aggressive looking at uh, opportunities to, to be as efficient as possible. And as right. Myra said earlier, we're blessed to have some additional resources this session for us to make good long-term decisions for Texas. Representative Simmons, we have an issue in this state, last issue I want to ask you about before we bring the audience in, of, uh, of a number of people without health insurance. In fact, we have the most, uh, uh, we have the raw number and the percentage of our population higher than any other state without uh, health insurance. The cost of health care in this state has now risen to equal and will soon exceed the cost of public education in the state budget. I understand that this is a conservative state. We declined to expand Medicaid, declined to embrace the Affordable Care Act. Elections have consequences. I get that. We know what you all are opposed to. What are you for as far as solving the health care problem? Well, first of all, let me say that health care is not an inalienable right. It's not something that we're guaranteed in our Constitution. We're not guaranteed that in the Texas Constitution. So for us to believe that that's something that we have to provide every living citizen, which we might want to, is, is just not based in law. Now, what, what we are for is we are for what sometimes is called a Texas solution. We believe that we understand what Texans need better than Washington does. And so what we would like to do is we would like to promote what uh, Congressman Ryan has talked about, and that is a block grant type scenario for Medicaid. Give because us the money back that we send to Washington give and, us let, the us, money and back, let us deal with it. That's right, and then yeah. let us, and you will hold us accountable for that, on how we provide that. Do I want everybody to be covered? Absolutely. Do I, I, I sincerely want everybody to be covered. However, I want to make sure that we do that in a way that's responsible. And unfortunately, I don't know that you can cover every single person without so increasing the burden on working class Texans that it would just right. be untenable. On the other hand, Chairman Parker, the fact is the uncompensated care costs at the county hospitals in Denton are in fact going up and are in fact being passed on to the very same taxpayers that Representative Simmons is talking about. Sounds like the taxpayers get it coming and going. If you do fix the problem and if you don't fix the problem. Well, look, I mean, that, that is obviously the challenge, Evan. I mean, obviously, I'm aware, obviously, of the expense burden that's uh, coming to us locally and so forth. But at the end of the day, we've got to, as Ron gave some very specific things we need to do, if you look at the overall budget, guys, you need to realize that 37% in change of that budget is going to health and human services. Another 37% in change is going to education broadly, K through 12, higher ed, and so right. forth. And if you look at the growth curve right now, by far and away, that is the health and human services budget will bankrupt the state if we don't get our arms around it. Right. So we've got to look for ways to contain costs. We've got to look at creative ways in which we can uh, look at cutting some of those costs. And I think that really gets down to your comments about zero-based uh, budgeting. You need to go through in the sunset process in health and human services and look at each of those programs and really assess the value of each of them from the bottom up. So, you know, the bottom line is it's just not sustainable. That's really my concern right. is that level of spending is not sustainable. And so I, we have to be very serious about that and, and prepare well for our future. Vice Chairman Crownover, the fact is that by not expanding Medicaid, not uh, expanding the affordable or embracing the Affordable Care Act, you all are in theory, in the eyes of some, leaving a bunch of money on the table. The Beaumont Enterprise, not the Austin American Statesman, the <laughs> Beaumont Enterprise editorialized recently that you all ought to just suck it up, find a way to you know, make the politics work for you for the next two years, take the money and hope a Republican president is elected in 2016 when uh, the Affordable Care Act would be repealed. But for God's sakes, in the next two years, don't leave that money on the table. Are you sympathetic to that argument? Well, I am sympathetic to the fact that the thing that businesses hate most, that the thing that they cannot deal with yeah. is indecision and uh, flux. And that's where we have dumped all of our medical people. And I am very, very sorry for that. But to expand a bad decision, I mean, it is uns- so throwing it bad is, money after, yeah, after bad. We can throw more money, and it's unsus. Do you put more money? This is unsustainable. Well, let's give it some more money, and then maybe it will last a while longer. 
I will say that right here in Denton County, there are some wonderful oper operations that are doing wonderful, uh, wonderful successes with providing health care on a sliding scale. Yep. And I think that if I could compare a poor family that needed health care, I would a thousand times rather them walk in to one of our wonderful clinics that are changing lives where they absolutely, they understand all the needs. They look at the person as a human. Yep. Instead of them getting health care insurance from Washington, D.C., where nobody gets a flip. E she said flip. <laughs> I want to be sure you heard that on the, on the live stream. She said flip. It, it would Quickly, be and then we're going to walk the microphone around. Yeah. Yeah. It would be irresponsible for us to take the money for a two-year period of time with the strings attached. Uh, I think it could have devastating consequences for our economy, and so you won't see us do that. I'm looking forward to our Republican leadership at the federal level and what they're going to do. Obviously, as a new Congress begins in January right. to address health care broadly. As someone who's had a, uh, loved ones, uh, my wife in particular, others have had chronic medical conditions throughout our lives, I understand the importance of improving our health care system, that we need to improve portability, we need to address uh, pre-existing conditions, there are a number of things we need to do, but we do it in a private sector, free market approach as opposed to a government takeover of an enormous piece of our economy. And so, you know, these are the issues that we will work uh, hand in glove with our colleagues in Washington as we go forward. Okay. We're going to take questions from the audience for as much time as we have. Please put your hands up. We'll walk a microphone around to you. I apologize in advance for having to shut the door at one o'clock or a minute after, but we'll take as many as we can. Hi, uh, Rob Curran, I'm a freelance journalist, and uh, I had a question prepared, but uh, the talk on immigration, I was hoping I could ask a second question too very quickly, uh, because I was fairly horrified as an immigrant that the bar was being raised for uh, second ger generation uh, immigrants trying to get into university. And I was just wondering, as the party of business, uh, how you balance that against, you know, data showing that uh, first and second generation immigrants are more likely to start businesses and be entrepreneurial. And then the second question, very quickly, was about uh, studies on fracking. There's a big study in Pennsylvania, uh, an epidemiological study looking at you get just one question, I'm sorry. Okay. You can pick. You want fracking okay. or you want entrepreneurship? Which one do you want? Uh, okay, I'll take the first one then. Thank okay, you. Okay, good. So what about the idea that somehow by allowing people who are first or second generation immigrants to be here and remain here, that the opportunities to create businesses and to contribute to the economy exists? I think we, uh, first of all, let's make it clear. We want immigrants, okay? And we do need to change our system to make it easier to get here legally. But what we, what we don't want to do is we don't want to be able to provide incentives for illegal immigration. So do we need to change our system to, make it be, to be easier to get here legally? Yes, we do need to streamline that. But does that mean just because that's broken that we should just go ahead and, and have a lot of illegal immigrants, uh, uh, allow them to come in, be on the system? Every, every undocumented child that came across the border this summer, Evan, uh, is going to cost some school district, okay, eight to eleven thousand dollars. And where does that money come from? Right. It comes from somewhere. So if the government is a zero sum. So game. if you sacrifice some of the folks who the gentleman is talking about yes. in the name of getting a handle on our border security and our homeland security, that would be a trade off you'd be willing to make. Yes, that's correct. It would be okay. Question, ma'am. Shirley Spellberg, precinct chair in Denton County. My, I want to thank you for your excellent questions. Been an excellent moderator. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and what I want to say to our elected representatives, all of us who supported these candidates supported them based upon the platforms, which are conservative, that they ran on. The problem is that you have all jumped onto the bandwagon for Joe Strauss for speaker again. There's a list as long as both of my arms of good conservative legislation, which many of you supported, that never got out of committee. Ma'am, so, so what's your question? So the question is, why do you not get behind Scott Turner so that these issues can come out of committee and be voted on on the floor? Let I know the business about how many uh, have done it, but that does not... Uh, 
make it good. Let's give them an opportunity to address the premise of the question. The premise of the question is, ma'am, that there's conservative legislation that is being bottled up by the current House Speaker. Would you agree with the premise of the question? And if you do, why don't you decide to change horses? Well, I, I just disagree that, you know, I know there are bills that people have said that have uh, failed to pass. Uh, there are lots of reasons why bills fail to pass. There are five to 6,000 bills every session that are filed. And with all due respect, as a freshman member myself, I, I, you know, there are many bills that I've filed that weren't successful. So the reality is, is that you know, on legislation that's important to Texas, uh, then I, I encourage uh, on these very important conservative issues that members, new members coming in, more junior members work with all of us collectively, and I believe that we'll have the chance to have a very successful conservative session. Uh, so, you know, I, I look forward to getting your thoughts on specific issues and ideas and concepts, and I look forward to being a supporter alongside Representative Simmons and Representative Crownover and the other Republicans in the House to get things done. But I, I don't support the premise that uh, conservative legislation is being obstructed when you look at the things that we've done. We passed voter ID in recent years. We've passed good conservative budgets. We provided billions of dollars back to small businesses in Texas. Uh, we've addressed, obviously, the issue around life. Uh, we've had the most uh, pro-life legislation uh, passed in the country here in recent memory. And so I'm proud of those accomplishments, and I think we can continue to grow on them in this next session going forward. Anything you want to add on the, on, the, on the premise? Well, politics is the art of the possible not the perfect. Uh, we don't do anything perfectly <laughs> as anybody, everybody in this room. I've had a great bill on uh, allowing uh, employers in the state of Texas to have a health savings account. And I have not gotten it passed in five sessions. I passed it in the House, couldn't get it in the Senate. That is absolutely a conservative thing to do. And so now we have denied, the, and the reason that they, they didn't want the deductibles, they thought it was backing away from your commitment to insurance, and so they didn't want that. Now they have gone ahead and backed away where we have these high deductibles, and if we had had the health savings account for the last six years for some young employee, they would have a wonderful benefit. And it so, was because the votes were not there. Right. You've got you to gotta be able to count. Point, point of fact. Do you believe that if there's good conservative legislation in the House and there are the votes to pass it, that a speaker can bottle that legislation up so that it does not get onto the floor? Yes or no? No. No? No. No? I've only been there one session. So but in the one session you were there, do you believe that's I, possible? I have not seen that personally. That's okay. Correct. Tried to address the premise of your question. Thank you very much. Back over here. I'd like to know why you continue to use the economic benefits um, argument where, in regards to the city of Denton when that has been thoroughly debunked by... You're talking the, about the fracking ban? Right. When it has been thoroughly debunked by the city using hard data from the city by city councilmen and the Perryman study uses a multiplier that is considered a trade secret, so he won't even tell us what that is. You're suggesting that the, that the argument against the fracking ban, that it somehow impedes the economic health of the city, is false. That is a false argument. It's been proven false All by right, the let's, city. Let, let's let them, anybody want to address the question of economic development and the fracking ban? Sure, I, I'll make the first comment. I, sure. I just respectfully disagree. I, I appreciate the question, but I respectfully disagree. Uh, the, the reality is, is that if you look at all the, all the sectors of the economy, all the folks that are, uh, that are uh, in that supply chain that are part of the industry here, and all the jobs that are created as a result, I, I think that data is just patently wrong. If you look at the Barnett Shale at its peak of its maturity, and of course it's fallen off dramatically now in recent years, over 100,000 jobs were created as a result of the Barnett Shale. And, and so that is a huge economic driver. In fact, when you think about the global economy, you think about what America was going through in 2008 and 2009 with that downturn. The reality is in our region, one of the reasons why we did so well is the Barnett Shale and all the jobs and all the economic vibrancy that it provided. So I think Ray Perryman is one of the finest economists in the world. I think most people agree with that. And, and I just fundamentally disagree with the premise. I do think it will have a, a negative economic impact here in Denton County and on the region as a whole. Got one there, ma'am. Hi, I'm Tanya Stafford. I'm a former, I'm a survivor of human trafficking. My question to Mr. Parker is, what are we going to do in aiding in this epidemic? I was sold out of Dallas. 
Dallas is number two. What are we going to do? There's not enough awareness. How many in here know that Human Trafficking Month is January? Just one. All right, so the question is, you're on this Joint Committee on Human Trafficking. Yes, what, what, what do you do to address the issue? First of all, thank you so much for being here and coming forward and, and being so brave and courageous, and I want to visit with you afterwards if we can spend some time. This is, a, this is a huge epidemic that we are facing here in Texas. And before I became Corrections Chairman, I started recognizing the magnitude of the problem mm -hmm. and then sitting on this special task force on human trafficking, I wasn't aware. I don't think many of us are. And we think that perhaps this is not happening in Texas. We think it's happening in other parts of the world, but it's happening right here yeah. in Dallas, Fort Worth. It's happening very heavily in Houston and other parts yeah. of the state. So we need to be aggressive. And so we've been having hearings. In fact, one of the references I made to being in the border during the summer months was having hearings on human trafficking. Yes. So I've been working with all of our experts across the state to address these issues. How do we stop it? You know, and there are a lot of issues. One is we need to address the issue of the John. All right, it'll be very direct. Yes. If you look at current legislation today, we're not doing enough to address no. the John. We've got to address the demand side. Yes. We will do everything in our power with border security to continue to secure the border and to control these elements from coming into Texas. But those that are here and those that no matter what we do will be here, we've got to address the demand side. Yes. And so uh, you can look for me to look at filing specific legislation this next session that will address the John side as it pertains to human trafficking yep. and more broadly to prostitution in the state of Texas. Yes. And I look okay. forward to visiting with you about it first. Right. Thank you. We have time. Take one more. Okay. I always make them unhappy when I it's take one more. I'm sorry. I apologize to those of you who are unable to have your questions asked, but we're going to... Hey, Evan, while we're waiting for the question, yes. can I make a comment? You may. Uh, you know, kind of going back to how the sausage is made on bills, the very last bill we passed was this proposition for the road funding, and it was a huge discussion. And, but what it got down to, it was everybody coming together and saying, okay, what do we want to have done? There were people that said, we're only going to fund roads if we put more money in education and all that. But when it all got said and done, we were able to get something done. And because we stuck together as conservatives, which is important, okay, we were able to get some extra protection on the rainy day fund on that the would not have been right, there on, that on the fund. Right. And that's because we worked on Absolutely. policy together and didn't get caught up in the personalities or the politics of it. Good. Last question. Ma Hi, I have a question for Ms. Uh, Crownover. So the Texas uh, Tribune ethics investigation shows that you receive royalties, dividends, and interest uh, from the oil and gas uh, industry, including Devon Energy. My concern is that these profits will trump your Republican values of small government in regards to our fracking ban. So my question is, will you be introducing any bills at all in this coming legislative session pertaining to fracking, such as the one that you, you presented in 2013 that would loosen the regulations on pits uh, used to store fluid from fracking? I think her question really begins with, do you allow your personal financial interests to in any way affect the way you do your public business? No, I do not. In fact, I have filed, I have passed very important bills. One was for the disclosure of the fracking um, chemicals. Right. And that was, that is a national uh, standard now that other states to look at so that the companies have to disclose the, the fracking chemicals. I passed a bill that got more pipeline inspectors right. for the oil and gas pipelines. Uh, I passed another bill that took actually four years of working that required the energy producers to clean up their well sites. That was one of the reasons that the wildfires were in West Texas. They weren't taking down their electrical things, and when the wind came, they would whip. And that has been tremendously successful. Do you intend to file any more legislation in the same vein in this session? Uh, we want a good, honest, uh, oil and gas industry. Just like when an attorney is on um, a, a, a committee that deals with attorneys. Doctors want good, clean doctors in the state of Texas. Energy people want good, clean businessmen in the energy business. And that was one of our problems this last time. Yeah. I think everybody knows that Devon is always a good neighbor. If there's a problem with Devon, they fix it. We also know that the other company that we were working with has a history of not being a good neighbor. So I think it's very important that people that know something about the industry 
are there working for the industry to make sure that it is a good, clean, viable energy company that respects the environment. I mean, we are all, um, you know, there used to be environmentalists versus non-environmentalists. I don't think that exists anymore. All of us want a better, cleaner world for our children and grandchildren. And that's what we're working for. Well, I'm sorry we're out of time. We could probably go on for a lot longer here. Let's please, first of all, thank the representatives, Cranover, Parker, and Simmons. <laughs> Chancellor, thank you very much for having us on this campus. We appreciate it. Thank you to the sponsors, to KERA, and to the Denton Record Chronicle for being our media partners. And of course, most of all, thank you all for coming. We enjoyed it. Take care. Thanks very much.